proximity to an attachment figure tranquilizes the nervous system. Hi, my name's David and I'm a relationship coach for Tech Geeks. I'm gonna be talking to you. This concept came from Sue Johnson, who I just took her training uh, in New York. It was fantastic. Sue is the creator of Emotionally Focused Therapy for Couples, or EFT for short. Now, EFT has the best outcome data of any couples therapy there is. And in fact, very few couples therapies have even been studied because it's hard to get data on this. And of, her, of all of them, hers blows the rest away. Hers is the best outcome data there is. She has no problem with relapse, and that's, that's very significant in any therapy. And um, she's also the author of a book you may have heard of, Hold Me Tight, and then her newer book, which um, I think is revolutionary, A Love Sense, where she talks about uh, the things that science has taught us about love and relationships. So attachment figures tranquilize the nervous system. So what does this, what does it mean to, what is an attachment figure? Let's talk about that. So an attachment figure is, you know, maybe one of a few people in your life that you turn to for emotional support. So as a child, this would be your parents, your primary caregiver, usually your mother, but it's like in times of need, in times of distress, who do you reach to? Who is there for you? Who cares about you? Who do you matter to? As an adult, this, all of the same attachment behaviors carry over, and this is what attachment theory is telling us, is your spouse, a close friend, people who you can turn to in times of need, need you know, that childhood friend that's always been there for you. And this is different from like a, you know, a beer buddy or a drinking buddy or like, you know, many, many guys might have like, hey, you know, let's, my best friend is somebody who, you know, we go watch the game with and we enjoy a couple of beers here and there, we play soccer with, with each other. Those are great friendships to have and that's, that's different. That's not an attachment figure in the sense that you're not sharing, or you could be, but usually you're not sharing your internal emotional landscape with this, this person. And that's significant. So the thing is, we can't escape this. We are bonding animals. Part, this ancient part of our mammalian brain needs to feel safe and secure with another person. This has been wired into us for survival. Imagine if infants, if they reached out and no one responded, if they cried and no one responded, they wouldn't survive. So, and this carries forward into our love relationships. And bonding, this idea of bonding, it's contact with someone we love. You know, just imagine that like soothing touch. Imagine someone holding you. Mm, just being, being in their arms, being tender and raw. And really it's, it's, it comes down to this question here. Are you there for me? Like, are you there for me? Are you really, are you there for me? Can I depend on you? When I call, will you come to me? And do I matter to you? Am I special to you? These are questions that allow, as we feel, and Sue talks about in the dimensions of accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement. So if your attachment figure, if you perceive those qualities in your attachment figure, you f will feel a secure bond with them. Um, getting a little distracted by the dog that's barking in the background, but um, now here's the thing. Um, when you perceive, and this is an example of an attachment distress situation, when you perceive a threat, your system goes into alarm and you need your attachment figure. Attachment figure soothes you. So I remember, geez, this is a while ago now, but I remember when I was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease. I remember the doctor just reading off the description of what that was and I was like, oh, what does that mean? Am I going to die? What, like, I had no idea, you know? And, and whatever, you know, searching for answers, whatever logical things I was trying to do was totally trumped by when I came home and I had that talk with my girlfriend at the time and I, I put myself in her arms. I was vulnerable, I was raw, and she got to see that tender part of me and, and she was there for me. And I had, I just, I was like, ah, oh, I breathed a sigh of relief, feeling that things are going to be okay. And that's the power of a secure bond. And it doesn't have to be a significant situation like this. It doesn't have to be life or death. Even though you might perceive it as life or death, um, it could be something as simple as, oh, I feel ignored because my friend didn't call me back. I was expecting you to hear from her. And you reach out and you say, oh, honey, I, I get that. I feel your pain. I feel that you feel ignored. I, that sucks. 
Now, it, it turns out that the degree to which, and this is something I've personally been studying and personally have experienced, is the degree to which I can risk being vulnerable and exposing my tender, raw spots, exposing my heart to my attachment figure, and the degree to which they will respond to me, and I believe they will, is the degree to which I will feel safe in their arms, that I will feel safe in my world. And having these bonds in me, this is the thing that propels me into life. And this is what research shows. The more secure you feel, the more you're able to explore the world. I mean, imagine that baby that never knows whether her mom is going to be there. And the baby's really anxious. He's like, oh, mom, mom, come to me. And it's like, the mom doesn't come or comes irregularly. It's like when the mom comes, the baby holds on tight. And it never really explores the world because it's always so anxious about whether the mom's going to be there or not. Or the baby that's avoidant. These are two ways that we as adults and children, but even especially as adults now, and we might not even realize it, we actually avoid the love and connection that would have us feel soothed. And for good reason. Like, we took a risk in the past. We risk showing our partner our tender spot, or, or like, you know, if I shared my diagnosis with my spouse and she was like, oh, that's fine, you know, who cares? That's all good, you know? Like, you can imagine, I mean, that would be pretty extreme, but if she turned turned away from me, I would be like, oh, wow. Oh. So I was in a place of extreme need, this key moment that, that turned away from me, it defined our relationship as unsafe. And I will, I will have that experience for the rest of our relationship unless we revisit this, what Sue calls an attachment injury. And that's something that you can be assisted through in therapy or by reading one of her books or learning more. Now, Sue did this amazing MRI study. I'll, I'll link the three clips from the YouTube video and I'll, I'll make a link to it on my website. So, um, husband and wife come in for therapy. They're, they're unhappy. They don't feel very secure in their relationship. The woman goes into, they have a woman go into an MRI, which measures brain activity. Now, before therapy, the woman is alone, then the woman is, has her hand held by a stranger, and then the woman has her hand held by her husband. The woman sees an X while she's in the MRI. The X indicates that she's going to receive an electrical shock to her ankles. And so in all three cases, she sees the X, her brain has the experience of alarm, of vigilance, of preparedness, of threat. Her brain lights up on the MRI, and then when the shock comes, it's like, oh, geez, that hurts. It was painful. And notice, when she was with her husband, it's almost like it had no effect on her. No difference. Her husband did not soothe her. So I believe they did about 10 to 20 sessions of EFT after that, and then they repeated the experiment. Same results with alone and stranger, but this time completely different with her husband. Completely different. Can you guess? The X came, no brain activity, almost nothing. It was like the threat wasn't even there. The shock came, no. Oh. That was just uncomfortable. So her husband holding her hand literally tranquilized her nervous system. The same stimulus was experienced differently by her brain. Imagine the implications of this for your whole life, for your world. You know, you can feel safe, you can create, you can be bold, adventurous, travel. So not only this, but imagine pe but for people who have trauma in their past, for people who are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder, this has huge implications for how they re-experience trauma as it comes up for again for them in their lives, how they live with PTSD, and also for people with depression and anxiety. Loneliness, or aloneness, and isolation perpetuate all of these things, and secure bonding is the antidote. And here's, here's the other thing, which you might not expect. Safe sex, good sex, is a safe adventure. And when I heard that, I was like, bullshit, no way. But think about it, when you feel safe, when you're not scanning the environment for danger, you can really explore, you can really let go. You can try those things out that you might not otherwise have tried. You can take a risk sexually. And like, I've experienced it, it's absolutely true. And, um, I encourage you to, uh, to t really take that to heart and see what it means to you. So thank you so much for listening. I'm just going to end with uh, some of Sue's words here, which I feel were very impactful, is that having a hand to hold 
changes our world into a safer place and soothes our brain. Thank you so much. I will put links to her books and this YouTube video on my website. And if you uh, know of anybody who would benefit from watching this video, I would love it. It would mean so much to me if you shared it with them. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -mm 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 -mm.